Good morning, Meadowbrook. It's so good to see everyone. You know, we had talked about wearing uniforms this morning, and first service was a little better. I don't see that many. I see like, yeah, I know, I know. We got some Packers shirts. <laughs> we got, well, anyways, uh, we all showed up to the costume party, and some of us were, wore our stuff. But um, sports are one of those things that um, is really exciting, isn't it? And it's in, for most of us, in most of our lives, we have some sort of correspondence to sports. Like, either we grew up playing sports, or we watch sports, and a lot of us are really excited uh, to get the kickoff today um, with the NFL. And as we were thinking about kickoff Sunday, you know, we usually call it kickoff Sunday. Uh, we were thinking about it earlier in the summer, like, what should we do for our theme for kickoff Sunday? And we just kind of chose the path of least resistance. We were like, well, what if we just do sports stuff, and people wore their uniforms, and we just had this kind of kickoff Sunday. And um, Sports are one of those things that most of us have some sort of relationship to, and it's a great unifier um, for all of us, I think, because we are kind of like all on the same team when we're following a sports team. And it's one of those things that I did with my friends all the time growing up. So just about every day, I'd hang out with my friends, go over to their house, so they'd come over to mine. We had big yards. We'd play just every sport you could imagine throughout the year. And so it was just like part of our lives. And even to this day, uh, my wife and I, we talk all the time about, you know, it's like, oh, fall is coming up. Like, what sports are we going to play? Like, are we going to sign up for that league? Or are we going to, like, go do this other thing? We usually play a lot of soccer in the summertime. Um, and so sports are just kind of what our lives have a lot to do with. And there's this um, ad that um, Dick's Sporting Goods has where they do these emotional ads. I don't know if you've seen this ad campaign come out. Where, but at the end of the, at the ad, it'll always say, sports change lives, which I think is really, really true. Um, because think about it, like community building, like learning how to be a team, learning how to work together, uh, learning how to deal with victory and how to deal with loss. There's just so many lessons that we have to learn from being on a team. But there's another side to being involved in sports uh, that we might not talk about quite as much. And for me, it's the fact that when I'm playing soccer, I can sometimes think or say things that I would never think or say at any other time of my life. Okay? Um, there was a person sitting here at first service who I play soccer with who I absolutely flattened on the soccer field about a month ago. And uh, now I have to be in a room with her all the time at church and be like, I'm so sorry that that happened. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was playing in a soccer tournament, a really competitive uh, men's soccer tournament. And I was defending a person, and the ball was bouncing. It was a 50-50 ball. We both went for it. And I very legally but very forcefully slammed into this person and sent him to the ground. And he was sitting there in pain. And instead of being my normal, like, helpful, kind self, I just looked at him. And I thought in my head, that was legal. You should get up. <laughs> like, like you need, in my head, I was thinking, you need to hit me harder. Like, come on, like, this is what we're doing. And so, like, I become this person that's a different kind of a person when I'm playing sports. Um, than in my normal life. And I just wonder, it, it could be sports for you, you, get, you might play sports, but I wonder if there's something like that in your life that you do periodically that causes you to act or think in a way that's like different, that you wouldn't normally act that way, but when you do this particular thing, you act that way. Um, another example is when I'm working out, I'll just tell my wife, just keep the kids upstairs. I'll be in the basement working out because they don't want to hear if a, a certain word slips out of my mouth while I'm working out because I'm really just going for it. Like, what is it for you where that, there's that little like 3% corner of your life? Like 97% of the time you're acting in a certain way, but then there's this 3% of the time when you're acting in this other way. Because in Paul's letter to the Colossians, he's really starting to hone in on that 3%. Like he's really starting to hone in on what is that, like, the fact that Jesus has come and died and resurrected for you, the fact that he's defeated these spiritual powers, it means something for that 3%. Like, Jesus is interested in that little corner of your life. And so last week, uh, Jake opened up Colossians 3. Uh, we were reading through it, and it gets into a few really common areas um, that we, we tend to get off track when we're following Jesus. Um, it, it, Paul is pushing us because it can seem really scary 
to follow Jesus with 100% of our life. Like most of us are comfortable with following Jesus with most of our life, but to actually become this sort of full, changed person is something that honestly can be scary because it means that we're going to have to relinquish control over that little part of my life that I don't necessarily want to relinquish control over. And, and it's hard for us to accept that like God has something better in store for us. He, he has a better kind of life where he could change our whole heart and we could become a different kind of person. And so that's, that's what we're going to get into here in Colossians 3 as we continue on. So I invite you to open your Bible uh, to verse 12. So Colossians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 12. Last week, uh, Paul really, he honed in and Jake talked about it, uh, these two kind of specific areas. I'm bringing them up because Colossians 3.12 starts with the word therefore. And you always have to ask that question, what, what is it therefore? If you see the word therefore, you have to turn your Bibles back and look at what you just read to figure out why is it there. Well, Paul uh, honed in on really these two things. He honed in on sexual practices as well as anger, as these kinds of like little dark corners of our life that we oftentimes don't let God touch and take control over. Uh, we, we don't want to relinquish control of those things often. And so last week, uh, there was this language of put off the old self. We're going to put off those things. This week, we're going to talk about what do we put on? What do we clothe ourselves with? So let's read Colossians 3, starting in verse 12. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So what, what I want to say before we even start getting into this passage today is that you, you're going to have to get this first part to get the rest of it. Because there's something that's going to be asked of us to do that if we can't grasp our minds around it and our hearts around, around it, it's going to be really hard to do what's going to be said later on in, in this passage. And so I don't know about you, but if I was a person in the church in Colossae and Paul had just gotten done telling me that I was struggling with sexual stuff and struggling with anger, I don't know if I would be ready for this next thing that he says. He says, you're God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. He says, you're holy. He's going to ask us to do some things that are too tall of an order for us. Like, it's going to be impossible for us to do all of these things, which is why he wants to remind us that we're holy. We're holy and we're chosen, and we're dearly loved. He starts with this reminder, and so I'm, I'm just going to ask you a simple question you can ask yourself. Do you realize this morning that you're holy? Do you realize this morning that you're holy and that you're loved? Like, remember what Paul just told them. He said, you have these anger issues. He said, you live in this culture that has misguided and dehumanizing sexuality all throughout it, and, and for all that we can tell, the people in that church probably dealt with some of that. They, they probably lived some of that out. There's a reason Paul is writing these things to him. And when we are confronted with sin in our lives, right, with, with sin that happens in our lives, we're going to be tempted to believe these headlines about ourselves. Like, we're going to be tempted to believe things like, oh, I'm a failure. I'm a failure or I, I'm disgusting. Or I'm never going to be able to be a true Jesus follower. And Paul knows this which is why he says this radical thing immediately after saying all these things. He says, actually, you're holy. He says, actually, you're holy. Actually, you're loved. Actually, you're chosen by God. And, and everything that now comes, it's going to come after this, has to be seen through that lens that you really are. You're a holy person. Did you know that? You're holy. It doesn't mean you're perfect. Holy me holiness means that you're set apart. You're set apart from God or for God. It has nothing to do with your moral accomplishments or your failures. It has to do with the fact that God has set you apart as his own. You are his. You're chosen. You're chosen. It means that however God has gotten a hold of you, whether that was like years ago or whether God's still getting a hold of you right now, you feel like God's still getting a hold of you, just know that it's not an accident. It's intentional. God wanted to get a hold of you and just know that you're loved. 
the word that's used here is agape. It's agape, the agape love of God. It means like this self, laying yourself down on behalf of another person. It's like, I don't just say that I like you or that I have strong feelings about you. I, I'll show you how much I'll love you. I will lay my life down so that you can have life. That's, that's all the proof you'll ever need. Like, God did that for you. And he's saying, you're holy, you're chosen, you're loved. And so wherever you're at this morning, like whatever baggage you walk into the room with this morning, I just, I just want you guys to recognize that you actually are those things. You can relax in God's presence. Like he understands your brokenness and he sees you as these things anyways. He's demonstrated his great love for you. So let's just relax this morning. And from that vantage point, knowing that that's how God sees us, let's look at what he's asking for us. How does he want us to live differently? He says this, he says, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, patience. Bear with one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Uh, Paul recognizes this agape love that God has, it's, that it's the conduit of his grace. His love is the way that his grace gets to us. And now we're going to start seeing the world. He wants us to see the world through that same sort of grace filter, that that grace worldview. So did you know that the people that you love to spend time with and the hardest person in your life, did you know that they're loved? Can you believe that the hardest person for you to deal with in your life is loved? That they're holy? They might not even know they're holy. They might not even recognize that they're chosen by God. God says he wants all people to come to know him. So did you know that they're already that way, that they might not see themselves that way? But are you seeing them that way? And so he wants us to have this renewed worldview. He doesn't want us to keep all the holiness to ourselves. in other words. He, He wants us to share it with other people. And if you start to see that, it should start to change the lens through which we see people to this different kind of lens. So let's look at that lens. The first part of the lens is something he says, compassion. I absolutely love this. As I was uh, looking into this this week, um, how that word is actually literally translated, it means the bowels of compassion. You like that? It means the bowels of compassion because in their worldview, the core human emotions were located in the intestines, in their bowels. This is where they came from. Uh, Now, in our day, we would say you have a heart of compassion, which if we're thinking biologically, is a little bit gross too. But that, that's what we're used to, right? But, but think about it. So he would say to them, I'm saying it because I think it's going to help you remember this. At some point this week, it's going to come up. Because when I think about bowels, I think about an emergency situation. <laughs> and so this week, I want you guys to be reminded that the compassion God wants you to show people, show it to them like it has to happen right now. Like, it's an emergency situation. That's what I was led to this way. I mean, it is hilarious, right? It's, just, it's supposed to be funny. But at the same time, it's like, oh, yeah. Compassion can happen right now. It doesn't need to wait until sometime else. Kindness. It's so simple. Kindness. I have a couple friends who, unfortunately, they, had, they went through a divorce. And if I had to um, talk about the process of that divorce in one word, I would say it was kind. They were kind to one another. Did you know that you can be kind in even the hardest situations in life? There are certain situations where we go, no, I could never be kind in that situation. It's actually possible to show the kindness of Christ to somebody, even in the hardest situations in life. Humility. It's ridiculous because in their culture, humility would never have been something you would want to do. You you don't want to be a humble person. You want to be a proud person. But humility really has to do with having a realistic view of yourself not thinking too highly of yourself, also not thinking too lowly of yourself, but just, this is who I am. I have my strengths and my weaknesses. Gentleness. Gentleness is actually literally meekness. When Jesus talks about the meek inheriting the earth, that's what this is. He's saying, be meek. Now, the image for meekness, which I love, is a stallion, this horse that is just absolutely powerful but that is bridled. In other words, it allows itself to be controlled by someone else. And so think about me knocking that person over, all that power and just slamming it into someone and taking them out. That's the opposite of meekness. That's like power out of control, right? And this meekness thing is he's saying you could actually 
hit someone when they need to be hit, and you actually hold off, and you decide that you're not going to do it. Patience literally means to be long-tempered. Do you know a short-tempered person? Somebody whose, whose temper is like right there. Doesn't take much. I'll get right to my anger, right? When, right when I, this literally means having a long temper. It takes so long to, to become angry. It's the opposite of short-temperedness. And then forgiveness. My encouragement to us this, this week, and not just this week, but do, do you have a practice every day where you remind yourself of what God has done for you on the cross? Where you remind yourself of just how much you are loved and forgiven by God. That, that, that love came at a great cost. Because if you do, you'll forgive other people. And so you put all of these things together. You put all of these qualities together. It's like a gl- pair of glasses. That this, it's like you're looking through all those things as you see the world. That is not easy to do, and it can't come naturally. It doesn't come naturally to any of us. But they all make sense through the filter of God's love. I mean, these things are describing Jesus, are they not? They're describing who he is. They all make sense when we look at who Jesus is because God was kind to me. I can, I can be kind to somebody else because God came humbly to me as a little baby. I, I can be humble with somebody else. That's our response. And one example in my life I'm reminded of is a guy that I knew when I was in college. This is Russ. Russ is up on the right there. He is a pastor in Eau Claire. He owns this little coffee shop. Um, my friends and I lived across from his coffee, coffee shop, and he's just the most humble guy I've ever met. And he spends most of his time in prisons helping people who are in prison, who, many of whom have obviously very complicated uh, histories, but also who have a lot of addictions. Um, and the city of Eau Claire and the county of Eau Claire has gotten to know Russ really well because they will send all of their toughest cases of people who need to be rehabilitated to Russ. And and might I remind you, it's not like he's some like certified, like PhD earning person. He's just a simple pastor who, who owns this little coffee shop out of which he does ministry. And yet the people that he gets to know in prison and who come to him after they get out of prison keep on getting rehabilitated better than what the city and the county can do. Because he's just this sort of person who has, he, he embodies all of these qualities. Um, another group of people that he really loves to get to know more is young college guys like I was at one point in time. And so me and my friends, we would meet with him once a week uh, for this group, and we were a mess. We were a mess. I mean, we had all kinds of problems in our lives, and, uh, and as a lot of young people do, as a lot of people in general do, and we would just meet with him and he would hear our stories and he would hear of our failures on a week-to-week basis. And every time we would share something with him, he was just so humble and kind with us and patient with us. It's like he had all the time in the world and he wasn't like offended by anything we would ever tell him. He was just believing the best in us. He was seeing things in us that we couldn't even see at age 20 or 21. And he was just patient and loving and kind with us. And so, friends, if we can start to see the world in that way, where we're trusting others, we're seeing the best in them, we're seeing things that they might not even see in themselves yet, we're seeing them through the eyes of God's kindness, and we're doing those simple little actions to show that if we start seeing the world this way, everything's going to change. And the first thing that's going to change is the church. And, And that's what Paul goes on to say. He says this in verses 15 and 16. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. I I don't know if you've noticed, but throughout this book, Paul keeps bringing up this image of the body. This is like the fifth or sixth time he's brought up this image of the body. A few weeks ago, he was talking about Christ being the head of the body and how we're all connected to him who is the head. And and it makes sense here because he calls us, the church, one body, and then he says that we are at peace. Now, if the first thing Paul is telling us is that each of us has this renewed worldview, the second thing comes directly out of that, which makes total sense. It's that we're a renewed church. Now, think about it. If we all have this renewed worldview 
and we're living life and seeing people differently, and then we come together on like a Sunday morning or on a different time of the week, it, it makes sense that this, this church should be renewed. Like, this should be a different kind of community. And he says that it's a body that's at peace. Now, the image of a body that's at peace probably seems normal to most of us, but we know that a physical body can actually be at war with itself, do we not? I mean, there's um, autoimmune diseases is kind of like a prime example of this, right? It's, think about where the body actually mistakes its own tissues or its own cells or its own organs as a foreign invader. That's really frustrating. That's a frustrating thing to have. I know some of us in this, this room have an autoimmune disease. We certainly, most of us, know somebody who does. That's really hard, right? When your body is literally at war with itself. It's, it's not a body that is at peace. But, but now think about, think about in the church. Think about if the church is at war with itself. Right? Think, think about if we're like getting f uh, focused on these issues that are actually not primary issues, right? If we're, if we're kind of wasting time on some of those issues in the church when the real reality is that there's actual real issues that real people have to face in their life that really do matter. And, and if we're just getting distracted with the wrong things. And so Paul wants to remind us, he's saying, church, listen, you're, you're at peace here. Your peace, Paul even mentions earlier, he says, the spiritual forces that come against the church, like those have already been defeated. And so put off that old self. Put off that old self that's been ruled by those old forces and put on this new self that comes from connection to Christ. And, and I love that he tells us how to do it. He says, sing songs. Sing spiritual songs. You notice that you get these songs stuck in your head throughout the week? And all of a sudden, you start believing the words because they came up on a Tuesday morning or on a Wednesday night. Or I still have songs that I was taught from when I was a little, little kid at camp that come into my head at the most opportune moments that remind me of who God is, right? Like, sing these songs because you become like what you sing. I love that he says, teach each other. Admonish one another with wisdom. Because if you are open to teaching from someone else, it assumes that you are in a place of humility. You're like, I'm open. I want to learn something. I'm open to the fact that I don't know everything. Admonishing? Admonishing is a corrective teaching. It's like hearing somebody correct you. And so um, it's like understanding that my understanding of God might need to be sharpened. I might get it wrong. But he says, do it in wisdom, which is like, don't just hear information and be like, okay, good. Now I learned that. No, wisdom means that you actually go out and live it. That, like, this week is going to be different than last week. That tomorrow is going to be different than yesterday. Um, it means that you don't just learn it, but you put it into practice. And so now imagine being a part of a church community where that's encouraged, where it's okay if you make a mistake, right? It's okay because you're, you're just one step along the way of learning how to follow Jesus, and we're all doing it imperfectly but we're in this culture where we're at peace. We're not at war with each other anymore. Um, some of us feel threatened when somebody's correcting us or helping us, but he's saying, no, start to form a culture where that's actually normal. Uh, I remember being at Elmbrook Church. I grew up at Elmbrook Church, and I was there um, in through my 20s. I was an intern there. And I think of the two Daves, uh, Dave Seamuth and Dave Bullock, these two pastors who were at Elmbrook Church for many, many years. These guys kind of took me under their wing when I was an intern because I have so many hilariously crazy, stupid things I did when I was a high school intern at Elmbrook. Nothing too crazy, but it's pretty stupid, pretty dumb. And uh, these guys would just kind of take me under their wing. I remember Dave Bullock coming to me, the, the worship pastor. I was 23 years old, and I just like, was making all these mistakes up on stage. And again, they weren't horrible, but it was like, yeah, you're a 23-year-old. You're making mistakes. And he would just bring me in. He wouldn't say anything about him. He'd just be like, he'd teach me about theology of worship and how we bring people into the presence of God. And then amazingly, I remember one time he brought me in. And again, I'm just this, this kid. And, and he's like, here, I want to listen to these songs with you. And then you get to pick one that we're going to do for this weekend. I'm like, why are you treating me this way? Like, why somebody with so much knowledge and so much to offer that he has this, this attitude of humility? And so, church, we, we have so much talent and knowledge in this room. Like, there's so much maturity in this room here, in this community. And yet, talent and knowledge can go one of two ways, can't it? It can kind of puff you up 
make you feel like I, I know everything and, and it's hard for me to, to put that off onto someone else. Or we can recognize, like with this renewed worldview, where we recognize our place in relation to God. We recognize that it's not actually us who has that knowledge. It was all given to us as a gift through our experience and through God. And so now we humbly come together and we teach each other. We humbly admonish each other, not because I've got something right and you've got something wrong, but because we all get it wrong at some place and we need each other. And so we're not only this renewed person with a renewed worldview, we come together and we have this renewed community, this beautiful image of this renewed community. But it's not only that. This message of Jesus is supposed to change every last corner of our world, which is why Paul goes on in verses 17 through 21. He says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. You know, you know what would be a shame? It'd be to put on this kind of like new worldview and then to go to church and and to be in this community where everybody thinks that you're great in the community, but then to go home and to actually have your family be afraid of you or, or to have your family be ashamed of you. And it's the fact that God wants to actually impact you from the core of who you are. He, he wants a renewed worldview in you, yeah, but he wants it to impact who you are at home as well. And so he addresses all of the members of the family. Now, for us to understand what Paul is saying here, we just have to spend a few minutes on the family because there's some stuff in here that as a 21st century American, you're going to be like, why is he saying that? Uh, so just uh, put, on, put on your glasses, ready? Imagine life in the first century. In his day, a husband in the family would have had full control and authority over his family. Women in that time would have only had citizenship through their husband. So you were either married and you had a husband and that's how you related to the government or you were living with your father. It didn't really matter how old you were, but that was your relation. Uh, men were educated, but the vast, vast majority of women were not educated. Their education was really about taking care of the home. And so you would, from the time you were a little girl, you would just watch how your mom and how your aunts did it. And you would um, learn how to take care and prepare food and how to take care of children. And so think about something like divorce. Like in our day, it's a very normal thing. In, in their day, if you were a woman and you were divorced, you were in big trouble. Because now this person who was taking care of you, this is literally your livelihood, it, it's taken away from you. And so imagine this. This is so backwards to our day. But the husband would actually keep the children in a divorce. And the woman, the, the wife, would go back and live with her father again because she needed some sort of a man to offer her protection and provision. And I share all of this because I want you to have a realistic image of what life for women must have been like in that time. No power, no voice, no influence, little education. Now, there's, there's a few exceptions to that that we see when we read um, some of the history, but overwhelmingly, Life for women in that day was radically different than what we think of life for a woman is in our day. And, and so it's into this context that Paul says this. He says, wives, submit to your husbands. Now, remember, in Ephesians 5, there's another passage where he says this as well. And, and there he tells the husbands to submit to their wives as well. But, but it makes sense that he says, wives, submit to your husbands here because... It's, it's basically saying recognize that your life as you live it has been provided to you by the provision of your husband. In, in essence, your life is in reference to this guy that you live with, and it, it should be a good relationship to him. Um, and so when we think about our relationship to God and Jesus as well, we're all in reference to that as well, right? Everything we have comes from him as well. And so now he's not making a statement about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. He's simply speaking into their reality. He's simply speaking to women in their reality. And he says, submit, which is a word that most of us really hate. Uh, but submission, if you actually look at what that word means, all it means is that recognize where you line up in relation to this other person, that there is a hierarchy here within the family in Paul's day. 
But here's where the radical thing happens. You see, in his day, he, it would have just stopped there. Quite literally, that's it. That should have been the only instruction. That would have been the norm, that women were to be subservient to men at every level of life, which opened up all kinds of abuse and all kinds of sin within culture at large because men wrote the rules and then men enforced the rules. But Paul says something to the men, doesn't he? He says something to the husbands. He says, love your wives. He says, love them, be gentle with them. And, and that word for love, it's not like, like your wife or think she's a good person. That would have been radical enough, actually, in his day. It's the word agape, which is the same word that he used for Christ to talk about who Christ is earlier in the passage. And so this agape love is that self-sacrificing kind of love that Jesus showed for us. He's saying, husbands, are you willing to lay down your life for your wife and your family? Like, quite literally, lay down your, your life for your wife and your family. That's what he's saying. In a, in a culture where husbands could do anything they wanted in their household, Paul is saying something radical to them. He's saying, no, lay down your life. Love them. Don't be harsh with them. Be gentle with them. In other words, here's the real catch, right? Be the kind of a man that your wife would absolutely love to follow. That's what he's saying. Like, make it easy for her where she would absolutely love to follow you. Be that kind of a person. And so he wants us to have this renewed worldview so that we can have this renewed church, so that we can have this renewed family. But Paul names one last huge portion of our lives as well. And let's read verses 22 to the end. He says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. This is a great passage we're reading this week. Uh, it's, there's some great, great stuff to pull from it, but we have some big cultural things to understand before we do, and, and we just went through some of it. But, but this is the other part of it, because the reality was in their day, they simply had a class of people called slaves. It, it's not the same kind of slavery that we had in our country, which was um, completely different and a lot worse in, in a lot of ways. Uh, this kind of slavery that was happening in Paul's day had nothing to do with your ethnicity or your race. You could be any ethnicity or race and you could be a slave. Um, it simply was the way that you got work done around the house. Is your, your family had slaves. Um, slavery was a common way to get these things done. And families often had slaves who did a lot of the grunt work around the household. And, and in return, slaves would get uh, food or shelter and clothing. they get their basic needs met. Um, and so the way that I would think about it today is imagine having a job that, that pays you enough money to cover your food and your rent and your clothes and your basic needs. That's kind of a similar thing to like what slavery would have been in that day. And so imagine that you are now living in this household and you are the head of this household. The question really was, like, how are you going to treat this person who is there with you? Because it's actually more like an employee. You can actually think of the, the person who's the head of the household like a boss or a property manager. And so it's what sort of relationship? Because you have this hierarchy now, this person who's the head of the household and this person who's way down here. And if you have this renewed Christ-shaped worldview, then uh, people who, like, think about in your own life. Do you have a boss who is higher than you? How do you work when your boss comes behind you at your desk and looks over your shoulder? You, th you start thinking, oh, i got to actually work now, right? No, none of you think that. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, you should be. He's saying, no, listen, your boss is not who you think it is. Work as though your boss is Jesus himself. How would, you, how would you act if Jesus was the one asking you to do this task? And that should change everything with it. Uh, bosses in the room, business owners in the room, like how are you with your clients? How are you with your clients? How about with the people that clean the toilets in your building, right? Or who mop the floors in the building? Like, are they just workers? 
Are you trying to pay them as little as possible so that you can make as much as possible? Are you trying to make life more difficult? Or are you like Jesus in the way that you own your company, in the way that you manage your company? Like, do you lay down your life for the people who work for you? Do you give them more than what they deserve when God blesses your company? And so when we take a, when we kind of zoom out and look at all these things from like our, our own worldview to our church, to our families, to our workplaces, I think what's easy for us is to just look at the brokenness in all of these things and to wish that things were better. And I think that that's a really normal thing. But here's the beautiful thing for us this morning. There's something that you can do because you might feel like you can't influence those things. There's actually something that you can do. God is not asking you to change anybody else. If you're married, you already know that. You can't change that person. You can't change your spouse. It's hard to change your kids to make them live in a way where they actually obey you. It's hard to change other people. But there's that 3% kind of hidden corner of your own life that God is actually really interested in. God's saying you want to have a renewed worldview and a renewed church and you want to have a renewed family and you want to have a renewed workplace? Of course you do. Work on this area right here. Work on this part of your heart, the part that you think you might not want to work on. That's the area that God wants to work on. Because when we allow God to touch and shape those areas of our hearts, to mold these dark corners of our lives, I'm telling you, just wait and see what happens to the church. Just wait and see what happens in your workplace, in your family. Because Christians, like God is calling Christians to renew every corner of culture. And that's our big idea for today. Like, He wants to renew every area of your life and every area of culture. And so maybe this morning you look at one of those areas and you just recognize, I want it to be better, but that God is the one who's calling it to be better, and it starts right here. And that's hard to do, to start with this vulnerability, but that's our invitation this morning, is wherever you're at, what is the next step of vulnerability for you? What, what would it look like for you just to say yes to whatever it is that God's asking you this morning? For me, it, it honestly might be to control my anger when I'm playing on the soccer field. Um, if for you, it might be something completely different. But let's bring our hearts before God this morning and just ask him to do that kind of work in our hearts. Would you pray with me? God, there's so much, and we are just so thankful for the way that you have revealed yourself through Scripture. As we read um, Colossians, we are just really amazed at the way that you reveal your very nature. Um, This week, we are seeing this vision that you have for us of just a different kind of world. And God, if we're honest, um, it's hard for us to embody that so often because we're weak and because we're humans. Um, And so, God, we need to have a renewed vision. We're praying for you to come now and by the working hand of your Spirit to come and change our hearts. Convince us um, that more is possible in our lives than we thought was possible, possible because of the work of Jesus in our lives. Open up our eyes to that. And then, God, my prayer this week is that you would just cause us to see the people that we come into contact with differently, that we'd see them through this lens the way that you see them. We pray that you'd give us a heart and a vision of compassion and love for everybody we meet this week. Do your work, God. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.